afternoon, all. Yes, I want to talk about peace. When, when people mention peace, there are generally two types referred to. Peace meaning the lack of violence or war, and peace of mind for individuals. In summary, the promises made by God in the Bible and the prophecies here about God's kingdom make it quite clear that when Jesus comes back to the earth and God's kingdom is established under him, there will be a time of peace in both senses of the word. But there is also a wonderful promise made by Jesus about this life. But I would say that it must, however, be correctly understood. Otherwise, we're in danger of joining the mass of people who trust in something and then are let down when it turns out to be not what they thought, not real. Our aim is always to avoid illusions and instead to focus on the reality of what God's plan is and what he has promised through Jesus his son. Now in that introductory reading there are plenty of what some people say could be nice words, reassuring words. Seeking God and finding that, in verse 4, he delivers me from all my fears. That sounds like granting somebody peace of mind, doesn't it? And so you could go on through many parts of Scripture finding such references. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. No idea what the statistics are, but... How many people in the world today, if you ask them, say they are fearful? How many would say that they have had their heart broken? How many people would say that one of their desperate needs is for peace of mind? Now, one of the best known parables of the Lord Jesus is about two men who built houses. Now the wise man used a solid rock as the foundation for his building while the other built his on sand and that one was destroyed very quickly when a storm came. The lesson is of course that when you have heard what Jesus says you should do what he says. That's the way to have a life built on a reliable foundation rather than ignoring what you have heard. So when Jesus tells us how to sort out our lives, how to behave in life and how to please God, it's no good ignoring him, his advice, his instructions, and then wondering why things don't improve, why things go wrong, why things go from bad to worse. I would submit that if we want the comfort and hope that believing Jesus brings, we must be sincere and serious in our following of his ways and in taking his advice about life. Now, one of Jesus' closest followers, the Apostle Peter, actually quotes from that Psalm 34 when he wrote one of his letters. And his introduction to the quote is this Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind for, and then he goes on to quote, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil 
and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. I'll just pause there. Not a case of sitting and waiting for it to come. Seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I think in that writing, both in the original psalm and in in Peter's use of it, we see a hint that there is a need for a proactive involvement on the part of the person seeking peace, who then is willing to do what God sees as right. These things being here closely linked, seeking peace and what God sees as right. Now, now this not, may not be the sort of thing you would expect to hear in a Bible talk uh, with this title, but I was fascinated when I realised there is, as so often there is, a good, solid, Old Testament background to something so associated with the Lord Jesus, the bringing of peace of mind to his believers. In the Old Testament era, the Jewish nation had a set of religious laws and principles and, of course, of uh, temple worship, tabernacle first and then temple worship, with uh, the involvement there of sacrifices as part of that worship. And they also had a calendar, an annual calendar, of their feasts when they were supposed to come up to Jerusalem and have these uh, festivals in front of God. Indeed, we should be aware that our word holiday, of course, comes from the two words holy day. They were given time, they made time, they really had to make time to go up and appear before God. And, and, and the sequence both of the festivals and also the way the sacrifices were organised gives us a hint. So the very first uh, thing of the year, of course, was the Feast of Passover, which celebrated their being saved from their bondage, their captivity in Egypt. So God had done something amazing for them, and that was the first thing they were involved in remembering each year. Then, of course, comes the hard work in an agricultural society of uh, all that that season involves and the harvesting and the thanksgiving to God for a good harvest. And then, in what we would call the autumn of our year, they had two festivals in quite quick succession. The first of those was the Day of Atonement, Uh, You will see this perhaps in modern uh, diaries referred to as the Jewish feast of Yom Kippur. And then after that, there was the feast of booths or tabernacles. Those last two are quite significant. The Day of Atonement was the time when the high priest went through a ritual which signified the forgiveness of sins for the nation. Uh, And that was, of course... A vital aspect of the relationship between God and his people. But shortly afterwards there was this great feast of living in the streets of Jerusalem, not going and, and visiting a friend or, or, or booking into the local inn. No, living in the streets, taking branches from trees and making yourself a, a, a makeshift tent. And, and everybody had to do this. Indeed there's a record in the book of Nehemiah about about how they did this and, and, and Jerusalem was so crowded they had to, to find extra space and, 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 and so on it, it was an amazing time and the reason was that the people came together they were all together joyfully uh, enjoying this time but also it was associated with being thankful to God uh, and it was one of the great feasts of giving 
It was also associated every seven years with the reading of God's law. So that as, well, just imagine it, if you're a youngster, you know, maybe you were four the first time your parents were involved with you went up uh, and all you would remember as a four-year-old would be this this great mass of all the nation uh, and this wonderful time of happiness by the time you're 11 you're taking in what is being read god's law and its meaning for you by the time you're 18 this is serious stuff you're now a mature teenager you're beginning to see the responsibility of life and understand the way God wants you to behave and by the time you're 25 you're probably married and bringing your own children to the feast as well but but always God has had this where the forgiveness of sins comes first and then there is a time of rejoicing and thanksgiving and that also applied in the uh, ritual sacrifices one of our Christadelphian authors in a book about the laws and sacrifices of the Jews in those days makes the point that the order in which sacrifices were made when there was more than one involved, uh, this has a significance. Uh, the first of any series was the sin offering. And obviously there we have a mention of the need to be made right with God, to have one's sins forgiven like the Day of Atonement in the national calendar. And only at the end was there an offering called the Peace Offering. Uh, and that was associated with fellowship and uh, joyous expression of God's ways, bringing you to joy and even righteousness. So both in the national calendar and in the personal offering of sacrifices, there was a clear recognition that forgiveness of sins comes first and then the rejoicing and in particular the peace offering which speaks of fellowship with God that comes later and I think when I said before that some people would be let down if they believed in an illusory idea of finding a way to peace of mind to understand how they can live a more satisfying, a happier life maybe this is what's missing it's putting the relationship with God right first that truly matters and then can come the joyfulness the rejoicing the peace of mind There's a particular New Testament passage I'd like us to look at. And it's the writing of the Apostle Paul, and it's in the book of Romans. The problem here, ladies and gentlemen, is you could either have the short or the long version of this. I, I could probably spend about two hours covering so many aspects of this theme. Um, but instead this afternoon you're going to get the much shorter version <coughs> the book of Romans is, is fascinating in many ways but what Paul is doing is, is doing what I've just tried to do and that is starting from the Jewish standpoint because after all Paul and, and many of his uh, readers were Jews although by now in the early church there were many uh, from other backgrounds who had come into the uh, faith and were believers in Jesus so there is this question about the Jewish background uh, and where that leaves us as Christians. Uh, and, and in the early chapters, Paul addresses those questions uh, and some of the challenges associated with them very effectively. The middle verse of Romans chapter 4 is something that I've often commented on, particularly when many years ago I read it in, in a particular modern English translation and realised what it was talking about so verse 13 the middle verse of Romans chapter 4 
the promise to Abraham this is the promise that he would be the heir of the world or, or in the revised standard version which I was reading the promise that he would inherit the world just stop and think about that Abraham was promised that he would inherit the world this is perhaps not what many people think of as the essence of the Christian faith maybe the Christian faith to them is, is more the personal and the peace of mind but, but this, is, this is geopolitics gone on steroids Abraham is going to inherit the world it says and, and that promise was not through the law not through the sacrifices and, and those sort of things but through the righteousness of faith and at the end of the chapter the apostle uh, carries on let, let me just if you're whatever version you're looking at let me just read these words to you from another modern translation and it's uh, starting in verse um, 21 of Romans 4 Abraham was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone but for ours also it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification therefore since we have been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through him we have also obtained access by faith to this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God more than that we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope so Abram was the prototype the template of the faithful person and we ordinary folk of so many many thousands of years generations later can likewise be part of God's plan because of the sacrifice of Jesus who has brought this possibility of being justified made righteous in God's sight and it's that last little bit isn't it that really hits home through him we've also obtained access by this faith by faith into this grace in which we stand more than that said Paul we rejoice in our sufferings now if you know something of the history of the early Christian church and the persecutions that were coming on them in that late, late first century era you would know just how those words would have more meaning to them than perhaps they do in black and white on the pages of our Bible. The sufferings, we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. So Paul is saying that real peace of mind is able to cope with far more than just a little bit of a local difficulty and it's transformed our mind this believing in God this having faith in Jesus this knowing that God will look after us 
so that we truly can trust in him and cope with whatever comes on us in our life. And of course, the Christian knows only too well that his Lord Jesus, above all, was one who faced an amazing mental load. The difference is that Jesus, because of his understanding of God's word, of his Father's inspired word of the prophecies about him Jesus knew what was going to happen to him sometimes we might say it's a blessing that we don't know how things are going to turn out in our lives but Jesus knew what was going to happen he, he knew that he would be arrested and, and speaking to his followers just before his arrest Jesus tried to reassure them about the future even though he also knew that when he was taken he would be falsely accused and condemned and in the most horrible way put to death, killed by crucifixion uh, and this is a selection of verses from John's Gospel in uh, modern English this is what Jesus said let not your heart be troubled. So, here was a man who knew what he was imminently facing. Hours away. But he says, let not your heart be troubled. Have faith in God and have faith in me. And then he goes on to emphasize the need to respond properly to situations and in particular to his invitation if you love me you will keep my commandments may peace be with you my peace I give to you I give it not as the world gives let not your heart be troubled let it be without fear now it's not for me to pry into anybody's personal difficulties what it is that troubles your mind why it is that you might be particularly concerned with this subject of what the Bible says to us about finding peace of mind but very simply my dear friends what I am saying is this with Jesus as our example with Jesus not just as our example but as the guarantor of our hope for the future we have every reason to listen to what he says to take that to heart and to mind and to see in reality these words may peace be with you my peace I give to you not as the world gives let not your heart be troubled let it be without fear and of course as we have seen there are many many places in the Bible that such matters are addressed so for instance the psalmist had also written many many years before cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you he will never permit the righteous to be moved in recent generations the phrase we shall not be moved has taken on a different meaning but the Bible meaning is in this context God will not let those who trust in him be so moved from their course in life so troubled by things around them that they lose their way Jesus himself discussed carrying burdens or loads and he certainly wasn't talking about big parcels 
when you uh, look carefully at what he says in the Gospel of Matthew. He introduces it as this uh, modern English again translation introduces it. The son knows the father. And the only people who will know about the father are those the son chooses to tell. Come to me, all of you who are tired from the heavy burden you have been forced to carry. Do you know, um, my, I, I, I'm not a millennial by generation, but, but I do consume my news now from the BBC website on my phone. Uh, and it's probably only the same as, as when one got a different, perhaps, cross-section of the news by other means. But if you actually analyse the range of awful stories from around the world, one can readily understand why people feel fear. Uh, people in those parts of the world where certain things are happening, absolutely so. Other people who care for others, seeing the terrible state of the world themselves, again, have concerns. The heavy burden that somehow some try to carry forced to carry Jesus says come to me and I will give you rest he carries on accept my teaching learn from me I am gentle and humble in spirit and you will be able to get some rest yes the teaching that I ask you to accept is easy the load I give you to carry is light. I don't think it's just a case of a different outlook. I think it really is a case of believing in God and in Jesus and finding that things are quite different. Later in the New Testament, we then read this. I pray that the God of peace will give you every good thing you need so that you can do what he wants. God is the one who raised from death our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of his sheep. So you see, although Jesus knew what would happen, and indeed it did happen, his death, God raised him from the dead. And that is the thing that alters everything. Because our normal assumptions about human life are suddenly shattered when we realise that one man, Jesus, was raised from the dead and that God says that he is just the first of those who will be raised on the day of resurrection. He raised Jesus because he sacrificed his blood to begin the new covenant that never ends. There's a new everlasting agreement between God and his creation. There is a complete change of scene of relationship of approach to things and therefore something quite different for us to focus our lives on and that portion of scripture concludes as I will conclude now I pray that God will work through Jesus Christ to do the things in us that please him to him be glory forever